Okay. I found this report on the internet. It's very, very good. In fact, I suggest you read it. Analyzing two-dimensionalizing model with CFT, Paolo Molinini or Molinini, uh, ETH Zurich. Uh, I prefer not to photocopy it. This is a, a, a long, a long document with a lot of detail. Just find the electronic version, save some paper. Um, it's very interesting to look at because it does all the detailed calculations and you also get to know conformal field theory. And I will follow it in the class. So I will, I will do the, I will uh, cover part of it on the blackboard. <coughs> now, um, to continue on the RG of Ising model. Yeah, here. So we got this RG part out that the K, K coefficient renormalizes like this. What we now need to do is the H, the H component of Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian was like this. We have analyzed this part. We n I now want to look at this component as well. We need this for um, RG to be complete. It's, it's an easier part, so in fact, if I look at minus beta H, this becomes K and let me just call this H, re redefine H to beta H. So what happens is that I have, um, I have taken a spins in the triangles. Each triangular section has three spins. So this is now very easy to do because it divides naturally into sets of three. So it looks like this. By sigma one i, I mean one of the spins which sits in the triangle. So it is this, this spin here. But we had worked out what the expectation of this is. It's equal to this factor. times sigma i, sigma i being the spin which sits here. But there are three of them. So it is 3h, this guy, sigma i, sum over i. This term becomes that. So I can easily find that H prime, H prime is H after renormalization, is equal to 3H times E to the 3K plus E minus K. <coughs> okay. The 
the difference with the K renormalization is that it mixes the two, mixes the two coefficients. In the K, you just had K to K, so you could easily differentiate it, which was why I did it first. But this one actually involves two. Okay, so I keep this here for a while so that you can take the note and continue down here. So I have a the RG formula for K prime H prime, <coughs> which is equal to some sort of, uh, which is equal to an expression of K and 3H. Something like this. So when I form my a stability matrix, or, hmm? what is F of K here? Sorry? What is F of K here? This, that, is that guy. Oh, it's, okay. Yeah. Um, the, I don't know who said it, but it said the mark of a theoretician is laziness. So I'm just being lazy. <laughs> So I, when I form this matrix, the K prime DK, the H prime DK, the H prime DH, and the K prime DH. This is clearly zero. And these two are not zero. So, so this is my M, which was the coefficients of the beta functions So you see that it is triangular, which means that the determinant of it is this term multiplied by that term. I know what this term is when diagonalized and the eigenvalue. So this is surely the other eigenvalue. I don't have to worry more. So the H prime the H. at K star is equal to 3 times e to the 3 K star, e to the minus K star. And that is a number which we have from previous calculation. So e to uh, lambda to the power y h is equal to 3 over root 2. Hence, y h is equal to log of 3 over root 2 divided by log of root 3, which is approximately 
1.57 is exact. So by application of RG, I can get both exponents, the other exponent we worked out yesterday, and having two exponents is enough to calculate all the exponents. And that uh, this is, of course, an approximation which has been um, which has been um, the first term of the expansion which I used. You can go to the second to the second term in the approximation, which has been done, and these numbers improve a lot. Um, but for us, it demonstrates the point that how what does R G look like for Ising model, and what does this business of calculating the exponents involve? is a calculation like this. And the point of this part of the course was to see the ideas which were explained in abstract, how they apply to the Ising model as an example. All right, next thing which we need to look at is how does conformal invariance apply to the Ising model. asking where does the exact number come from? Exact number comes from Onzager's exact solution. That's it. Sorry. Yes? Is the approximation only when we define this sigma big I? No. Well, yes, in a sense. Hamiltonian was written like this. The difference between H0 and H interaction was not that the, there is a small interaction, but that I separated the, I separated the spins inside the triangle and spins outside the triangle. So it spins inside the triangle went into H0. It spins outside the triangle, which would be these, these two interactions. All these interactions exist between the, the, the lower triangle and upper triangle, and so on with the sides as well. It's a lot of spins interacting, but my point, or in fact these, uh, these two guys point, of their observation is that these other spins, they are thinner. They're not as many as the inside internal spins. So they, they are play, probably play a less role. And this is what we did. We separated these guys from these guys. And the, the approximation is that now this H interaction will come in as corrections to the main term. And this was the first correction. So I was, I was calculating the average of H interaction. And this went in as a correction to the, yeah. to the main calculation. It's this guy which is giving me these numbers. 
The next term will be H interaction S squared. minus H interaction squared. This will be the next one. A little bit harder because when you square it, not only you have to take account of these spins, but also this guy interacting with the second triangle away. A little bit hard, but can be done. Okay. So, what I have done is Ising, I have looked at it under a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, RG, and now I want to look at it on the CFT. This, this, is a, this is my claim that any critical point, so it, it actually has to be criticalizing. You can analyze any critical model, critical point, from these three points of view. Each of them has its own merits. So it's this guy which I want to do, and this is an example of the Ising model. It has to be possible for all other critical models in two, in two dimensions. So let's do the CFT. How does this work? So, um, this is a lattice calculation which you can find in many books. You, this, this does come out, that the two-point function of spins at i and j falls like the distance between them over a correlation length. But we know that the correlation length diverges with t as t tends to zero. Hence, what happens is that this power law disappears. Again, you can do this calculation for the 2D Ising, and you find that at the critical point, we have this behavior. Um, so two spins still have a reducing correlation, but the reduction is much slower with power one quarter of the distance. Hmm? Connected green function, is that this question? Yes, yes, this is the connected green function. So I, I have writ not written the second part um, assuming that I'm above TC and it vanishes. But what has to sit here is the connected field function. Fine. I want to get this power of one quarter out of conformal field theory. The whole point is that where does this one quarter come from? This is one of the critical exponents. In fact, eta is equal to one of the one over four. So let's see how that can be done. The claim is that this this Lagrangian for a com for a Majorana field epsi corresponds to the Ising model. What you, have, what you should read that as is 
a psi and its complex conjugate and the derivative is now with respect to z bar so it's actually saying that a psi is only a function of z bar sorry only a function of z this is the action the equation of motion will actually be d bar a psi is zero so a psi is just a function of z the uh, 60 million dollar question is how do you know that this is the Isenman? And this is what I'm going to do. Um, let's see. All on the blackboard, I am sorry. Too much mathematics and could not prepare a, a slide for it. Has to be has to be explained. Why it should be a fermionic field? Why should it be a single component fermionic field? It's a, it's a single component fermionic field. It is not two. Two. It's not a doublet. So for, for those who came late, uh, this paper is in fact what I'm going to follow now, uh, which you can find on the internet. Um, search for these name, these keywords. It is not a paper. It is not a. Uh, it's not an archive. It's just on the internet. Somebody wrote it and put it up. So what I want to do now is to go from lattice Ising to continuum quantum field theory. To do that, best point of a start is quantum Ising, not classical Ising. So I start from quantumizing and the, the other thing to observe is that if you start in quantumizing you have to have d equal to 1 it is an observation which uh, is old and uh, on my part I don't understand it fully but quantum critical phenomena in D equal to 1 correspond to critical phenomena thermal critical phenomena in D equal to 2 And there is a calculation which shows, says that, in fact, you can, if you take quantum, there is a quantum mechanical theory which is d equals to zero, and that will correspond to Ising in d equal to one. These calculations exist. In, I think maybe this one also is in that paper. Um, so it's, it's interesting that now there is, there is a whole community of people challenging that ex, uh, a statement who are studying quantum critical phenomena. They are saying that you cannot really get all of it out of thermal critical phenomena in a higher dimension. For example, uh, Mr. Suchdev has a thick, long book on quantum critical phenomena, which I would have thought it's unnecessary. You just have the two higher dimension and you come down. So he has a reasoning, and uh, I cannot follow it. 
But here it, it applies. For the case of Ising, it applies. So we can, in fact, do this. Go to take the one dimensional quantum Ising, and from this, we can go to thermal Ising in D equal to 2, which is our aim. But first, I will come down this way and show that quantum Ising in D equals to 1 can correspond to this conformal field theory of Majorana of free Majorana Fermi. But how? How is the question? So the quantum Hamiltonian for I zing in one D is equal to So what I now have is a chain of spins, and now they are quantum spins. So I have the full set of Pauli matrices flipping them. So, and it is one dimensional. So on each point of the lattice, I have these Pauli matrices. And the Hilbert space will be a Hilbert space of 2 to the n quantum spins, which can be in the state up or down. The other things apply, neighboring Neighboring sites only interact. Um, let's write this carefully. I plus one, I. Now, this picture is okay for a statistical mechanics, but because I want to go to field theory, it's not okay. In field theory, I need creation annihilation operators. So I need to connect these guys with creation annihilation operators. And its question is how? So in fact, in, in, on the chain, I have a spin up and a spin down, two states possible on every side. I want to change that picture to chain, empty side, full side. This is the quantum field theory image. If you are not familiar with quantum field theory, the Central operators in quantum field theory are creation and annihilation operators. So that CI, when it hits the vacuum, kills it because the role of CI is 
kill a particle at I. It's called an annihilation operation. And a CI dagger, when it hits the vacuum, creates a particle at site I. It's a creation operator. So I'm going to associate the concept of no particle with a spin up, for example, the concept of one particle with a spin down. And in this way, the, the Hilbert space is not enlarged. I had a Hilbert space of 2 to the power n, and again, I still I'm keeping it as 2 to the power n. Yes. So, between the two, between the two nodings, so there is a correspondence between spin up and, uh, for example, low particle, or spin down and the presence of a particle? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. If you have a background in a solid state, you may be able to understand this much easier than me because. You see, in solid state, people are used to this kind of Hamiltonians. This kind of Hamiltonian kills a particle at I and creates a particle at I. It's, it, the aim is to derive such a shape before we can turn it into a filter. Once we have that shape, then there is a standard method to turn it into field theory. So what I have to do is to go from this spin up and down to existence of particles or non-existence of particles. So In the, spin sh in the spin formalism, sigma i z gives me the sign of the spin. Sigma i plus flips the spin. Three, three operators in the spin formalism. These plus and minus are x plus y, x, sigma x plus sigma y. So what are the corresponding operators in this picture? So corresponding to these operators, I have the CI operators. So CI operator annihilates. So in this picture, it's opposite to this picture. Up is existence, down is not, not existence. And ZI, sigma I minus one brings it back. And then I have, um, I have this operation, sigma z just gives me the sign, and you can see from here that if I have a, a spin up, 
CI takes the spin up to spin down. CI plus breaks it back there, and 1 minus 2 will give me 1. Alternatively, if it is down, this will annihilate it, and I get, uh, I get a, a plus 1. So these are the right operators. Now, yes. general answer to that general question is nothing. <laughs> there is no algorithm for every Hamiltonian that works. The prob it's uh, like the other question that came up the other day. A lot of theoretical physics is creativity. You, you create a solution for a particular problem. To be able to create a general framework is pretty hard. So in general, to go from a statistical mechanical model to the corresponding field theory is no easy task. I don't know how to do it. For instance, your question can be applied to Q state POTS model, which has a bigger symmetry and the corresponding conformal field theory, although I know what it is, I don't know how to arrive, at least I don't know, maybe somebody does, to arrive from it to it from a given discrete model. So see, even for Ising, as you will see, it's pretty involved. And it's, this is the simplest model. Uh, I, set you, I set you a research problem, if you like. I, you know the abelian sandpile model that Professor Dar is talking about. I know the field theory that it corresponds to. I have it. I can write it on the paper. But I cannot go by similar calculation from the discrete statistical model to the quantum field theory. And that's an excellent paper if you can do it. Huh? Okay. So the next the next question is that we need to have commutation relations. We need to have commutation relations which are C I dagger C I equals to one and uh, you see that it holds here. Sigma i plus sigma i equals to 1. So far, so good. the same answer I gave him. It's magic. <laughs> there is no how to it. <coughs> yes? Could you explain again the relationship on the left corner? Here? Yes. So I have a model. Um, I have a model which... Uh, Ex a spin up is existence of particle. A spin down is non-existence of particle. The sigma, the sigma fields, what it does, 
is that it flips the spin. So it, if, if I have this as existence of particle, it flips it to a spin down, so it must correspond to an annihilation operator. It is a particle at I and I kill it. Sigma i plus on the minus state uh, should kill it. I see what you are you saying. Um, Um, it doesn't do anything because sigma i plus squared, if I'm right, is equal to sigma i plus. So if you apply another one, nothing, nothing will happen here, and uh, it just leaves it the same. Okay. So you obtain again the state minus. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. And the same is true. And these operators exactly do the same thing. They, they annihilate a particle, and then, then if applied to a site which has no particle, nothing happens. But if the sigma i plus is the annihilation operator, if, if okay, sigma i plus corresponds to ci. Yes. So if I apply into minus, which is the state zero, I should obtain zero, the number, not the state, right? If you apply CI to the state zero, it does, it is, it just gives you zero again. It doesn't kill the, it, it, it does. Zero, which is minus. But zero or the state zero? Because on, in the first no. line, you wrote you, If you apply CI into state zero, you will get the number. Yes, there is a problem here. I'm confused. Let me think about it a little, tell you. Okay. Okay. Also, there's one minus two C dagger C. Yes. It's the opposite, right? The right way to reproduce the left. Uh, because if when you apply a spin up, you. If, if you, you, mean it's, you mean it's CI, uh, CI dagger? No? no? If I accept that, it's not true. But I mean, apart from his question as to why, why this works, if I accept that, 1 minus 2 ci dagger ci on 0 will equal 0. So 0 is a spin down. 0 is a spin down. Yes. However, if I apply this on a, a spin up, so which is one particle here, this will equal to one minus two ici dagger zero, 
and then this will put a 1 in it again, 1 minus 2, 1, which will equal to minus 1. Okay, I, I agree with you. Okay, I agree with you. Yeah, thank you. But, but also the fact that sigma i plus to the square is equal to sigma i plus is strong, right? Because if you, uh, uh, so I think it, if you apply sigma i plus to sigma so plus, you obtain minus, but if you apply it again, you obtain zero, right? Because if you go down two times, can you go to the no state? This is what I'm. This is what I cannot remember exactly. Sigma i plus is this. Yeah. So apply to the status zero one. So sigma i plus squared seems to be zero. Yeah. Um, so if sigma i plus squared is zero, then then this works out right because sigma i plus and minus will give us zero. So I have to, and then, or on plus, maybe you call it uh, reversely, but one of the two applies two times to once the same state should be zero. Yes. Um, that's right. So sigma i minus I think maybe and, and the plus must give you zero based on this definition. So I have to I have to interpret the no as the no state with positivist. Yes. This one? Yeah. That's okay now? Thank you. Excuse me. These plus minuses are confusing. After the lecture, I will get it out and tell you. Otherwise, we will spend half an hour <laughs> Let's come back here. So I want this anti-commutation relation for my operators. And uh, it's okay because these guys also have these guys also, also have this anti-commutation relations. So s everything so far is OK. Now, there is, a, there is however, a problem. It's just on the face of it is OK, but there is a problem. The problem is that these guys at i not equal to j must anti-commute, but these guys at i not equal to j commute. Is that true? So here we have a problem. We need to 
we need to uh, solve this problem. And this is solved by doing a, what is called a Jordan Wigner transform method, a string, various names. What Jordan Wigner suggest, suggested, actually this was used to solve the Ising model in 2D, but it's also used here, is that you assign a string to, to solve your problem. That is, you take sigma i plus, is equal to pi <coughs> if it is about that to know. These are fermionic operators, so they anti-commute no matter where they are. So this is always true when i is not equal to j. These are, operate, these are matrices which act on the Hilbert space. And if they are at two different sites, they won't see each other, so they commute. This commutation is inconsistent with this anti-commutation. I need to have that. So this simple definition, a simple definition that this is equal to that will not be acceptable. I have to find something more complex. And what I find which is more complex is this guy. I take this pre-factor multiply C I with. And now, despite the fact that C I is anti commuting, this guy will become commuting. This is called the Jordan Wigner transform. It's or, or construct. So at the site I, you are in fact taking a string coming in from infinity, ending up at the site I. To see how it works, it may be easier to invert it and then uh, look at the relations. So when, you, when inversion happens, so if I invert those relations, I'll get ci is equal to pi sigma i z sigma j z. See, when I, if I use the correspondence, this is sigma z, my, this multi, power 2 is equal to 1, so I can multiply it by that side and get an inversion.
Now, this guy C i C j equals to pi of k is smaller than i sigma j sigma k z pi k is smaller than j sigma k z sigma j plus we want to see what this looks like in fact if I take I bigger than J I can start calculating if I is bigger than J this has no problem going through that so it goes and sits here If I do the reverse, this will go and get stuck. This will, this time, it will not go true because somewhere here um, sorry this is better written this cannot go through that string because somewhere here j equals to k and sigma plus with sigma z does not commute. So I have a string And here I have to use the commutation relation between sigma plus and sigma z, which is a
Yes. This, the, the, from here to go to there. Yeah. You see this sigma j goes through this uh, string until it arrives at i. Okay. It commutes with everybody until it arrives at i. Yeah, so at, at j equal to i, 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 I pull it out. And then the, the rest of the string goes here. Um, you are right, I have missed something. So when it hits this string, there is a term for which the index of this is equal to one of these sigmas. I take that out, which is this guy. And then the others are either smaller than j or bigger than j, which, which go in here. So whereas this here could commute through the whole spring, when you reverse it and you write it like that, it cannot commute through the whole string. There is a sigma in here that it has to, it has to get past. What? Yes, because this thing, a squared gives, gives you one. And these are sigma z's. Just multiply by this factor from the left hand side, but use sigma instead. If you get this, you get a, that expression. Yes. We should control that when we act to plus and minus, if we get the right step, so the right state. Sorry, I didn't understand. You, we, should, we should control that uh, when you act to the Jordan Binner operator. Yes. You act to the right, you get the right state 
when you act on uh, plus and minus. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, but you do because all, all these estates are plus or minus one, all these operators. And only this one does an annihilation or creation. Now, how, with that problem sorted out. So this doesn't create, this doesn't give me anything wrong because these are just plus minus ones and see, I either annihilates or creates. And the same is true here. What I need, what I really needed to check is that these guys then now anti-commute at unequal sites, which is this relationship. This is what I'm trying to, to test, which is more important than the, um, than the, uh, the, than the sign problem there. So I th this is uh, somehow stuck here. I, I did it this morning and it worked. I don't know why it's not working now. Um, Okay, I don't seem to be able to, to do this, but anyhow. <coughs> so this calculation also I will do later and give it to you. Um, so with this formulation now we have CI Ci equals to zero. Ci Cj dagger equal to However, this was done for simplicity. What we now we need is to rotate the spins a little to get the, to the Ising model. So I actually need to, instead of sigma z, use sigma x, and instead of sigma x, use minus sigma z. That is to, to get back 
to my eyes ignore. So what I now have to do is take h, which is equal to minus j, minus g, sigma i x plus sigma i i plus 1 of z, put in this transformation, And uh, now this is really long calculation to see what this goes to. And also a very careful calculation. It's not solved, no. Not solved. And Hamiltonian comes out to be Okay, now this calculation is, is going to take a, a while, so let's just trust this paper. And I know from other sources that this is right, that you get a Hamiltonian in terms of CIs, which is now looking very much like condensed matter Hamiltonians with CI killing at site i and ci dagger creating. So this is actually saying that it jumps to the next thing. So a, a particle, if it exists at site i, jumps to the site i plus 1. And here it goes in the opposite direction. If it exists, sits on site i plus 1, goes back to site i. This is also okay. These two terms are not what we want. The reason is that this term, for instance, just destroys a fermion. There is no conservation of fermion number here, and there is no conservation of fermion number here. This kills the fermion completely, and this one creates two out of nothing. 
And um, this is the problem I have. And how can I solve that? If you have an open system where fermions disappear on the edge, it's okay. That's acceptable. These are fermions actually dying on site. But uh, it's a local conservation. Local conservation is that. Yeah. yeah. So what is the solution? Um, yes, I need the G. You can tr throw away the G, but the thing is that this this has this way, sort of gives you a number. Um, that's actually yeah, that's right. If you remember, that was my sigma z. It is. I need the G to keep this zero. That's all. So the solution to this problem is that what we do, which is called the Bogolibov transformation. of transformation is that you go to another set of spin operators which are related to these guys by a rotation. I'm always allowed to make such transformations, which mixes up my operators on the Hilbert space. It's a linear combination of the old operators giving me a new operator. And clearly, gamma k dagger has a, has a corresponding expression. The reason I'm, you see, the reason I'm allowed to do that is that Maybe that operator which is written there is not in the correct diagonalized form. So all I'm doing is that rotating it a, a little bit. And uh, in fact, that's all Mr. Bogolibov has said, that you are allowed to make such transformations provided it's just a rotation. So UK has to be taken some sine and cosine UK is taken as cosine of theta, K divided by 2. VK is the sine of theta, K over. And this is now just an angle, not an operator. And if you choose now theta k carefully, you can end up with the correct, with the correct shape for the gamma operate, for the gamma Hamiltonian. See, this is, you can see that this is a quadratic form, and therefore the, the, 
that the fact that I can find a transformation to transform it into this shape is not, is not a strange. Say from beginning again. Yeah, actually, express your concern. So I don't <laughs> understand what is your concern. Yeah, uh, I, I don't understand what is exactly the problem. Is, is, is it a physical problem or it's just something that you don't like that parents do see? And you just did them not the transformation. So. No, well, the, the, when it comes out like this, I have started from some definition of annihilation creation operators and I've come up with this. What it does is that it does not conserve fermion number. Now, this could be a physical problem, as you say, that is my theory is non-conserving. It could be just a mathematical problem, that this is not actually fermion number, it's some other number and it doesn't have to be conserved. The question is, can I rewrite it in terms of operators which gives conservation? However, those operators will not be these operators. So you can, you can imagine it like this. For example, if you have two chiralities, you may, you may have a situation where you don't have conservation of chirality, but you have conservation of fermion number. The way you have actually is that a fermion operator is a linear sum of the two chirality operators or vice versa. The, the, the thing is that what you call here fermion number may not actually be fermion number. This is fermion number and it is conserved. Yeah, so if we now claim, I now claim, that these gammas are the creation annihilation operators for the fermion field, <coughs> which is that guy. And uh, if you know field theory, as soon as you see this, you know that I can do it because this is a standard form in field theory for the energy of a free particle. Or in other words, I have interpreted my fermion field as a, a large number of harmonic oscillators, and this is a harmonic oscillator energy, but in all <coughs> excitations, K. There is some calculation which I've missed up in the middle, middle of all this calculation. I've left something undone, and that is to derive these coefficients epsilon k, which uh, clearly would have to come out in terms of these thetas and the way these thetas are related to g and h, which I have not written. So epsilon k is equal to twice j squared plus h squared minus 2hj cosine of k. The square root of. So you see that for different values, this will never become negative and may have, a, may have a zero of the energy or 
it will have a minimum of energy, and I can subtract that minimum of energy. So there is a state zero, which is the minimum state energy, and it therefore has to have the property that gamma k on this vanishes. Now, to go to the continuum limit, what I need is a Fourier transform or a Necessary. So I need a lattice spacing here to get the continuum limit relatively easy. So what I have to do now is to put this thing back into my Hamiltonian. Again, uh, long page of calculation is necessary, and I end up with this Hamiltonian. So this is a continuum field theory now by doing a Fourier transform and arriving from this Hamiltonian. Here is a, an observation. If J equals to H, delta will vanish. If delta vanishes, then epsi will be a scale invariant. So under epsi to lambda x, you see that this part of the Hamiltonian is a scale invariant. This part is not because of the delta. So in fact, delta is playing the role of the mass, or I can say delta is proportional to the reduced temperature. So if you have a mass or if you have the T in here, it's obvious that you don't have a scale invariance because that gives you a scale. Once this vanishes, I have a scale invariant Hamiltonian, which is almost what I have there. It's almost what I have there because it doesn't have a time component. But I can always create a time component by going into the path integral representation, go from this to the Lagrangian, and that's a re relatively ar artificial thing to do, and I can put that in. The constant V 
is uh, appearing here is not does not cause any troubles. It uh, just sets the scale or the coupling constant or something. Yes. Yes. So this is, um, I'm sorry, this comes from my background. I am sometimes talk about mass, sometimes about temperature, but they, they are really interchangeable. If I go to the patentical representation, what I need in here is the Epsi dagger, the Epsi dt, to get that exact action. So once I get that exact action, I have a two-dimensional action. It is conform. It is a scale invariant, and also conformally invariant. So, epsi d bar epsi, and psi bar d psi bar. And the variation with respect to epsi gives me the equation of motion which implies that epsi is only a function of psi. Let's do something. Let's say epsi lambda z is equal to some power of lambda times epsi of z to test a scale invariance. What I get then for this term is lambda 2a minus 1 From here, I get lambda squared, and this one's I want to be one. I want it to be a scale invariant. Therefore, a comes out to be minus one. Is that right? Yes. X and T, yes. Yes. And then in here we have a field which depends on a complete. Yes, so you have to make a definition, for example, of T plus IX. H, yes. But this is something which, uh, something which I jumped over. The thing is that 
Quantizing in quantizing one dimension in presence of a magnetic field is equivalent to thermalizing in two dimensions without a magnetic field. Okay, this coming out to be one half. Now I can ask. What is the green function? Did I write bar or of epsi with itself? Now this has to be something which respects this scaling, so it has no choice other than being z1 minus z2. Yes. It's, um, so we can think about it of the exponent that keeps the our action invariant. Yes. Okay. So so if we get the Lagrangian of our theory, we can say directly what, what's the exponent do that we need to. If it is free. Hmm? If it is free. Okay. If if the action if you don't have a free field theory, so these are called. Here, this is called the engineering dimension. It is the engineering dimension because you can just read it off the action, to keep, which keeps this action invariant. However, if there you have interaction, the engineering dimension will pick up an anomalous part which comes from quantum interactions. So if it is free, you can depend on this calculation. If not, you have to do a renormalization group. Mm. Sorry. In this case, A is not the lattice space. A, a very good point. OK. <laughs> C, or if you like, H. So I have a field Epsi, which has H Epsi, H Epsi bar is equal to one half zero and for epsi bar h epsi h epsi bar is equal to zero one half to make correspondence with my notation of how you build fields for cft so this is a conformal field theory with this H H bar structure. Yes. Why, why it cannot have any independence on the complex conjugate of C1 and C2 when the degrees No, it, it can have, except that I have only written um, the real part. There is a complex part as well, which multiplies this. I have to, if I want to be completely careful, I have to write. Um, but, but still, there are some other pairs that can appear. For example, 1 over uh, complex conjugate of Z1 minus normal Z2. No, those things it cannot have because it has to be, it has to be conformally invariant in the sense that this tells me that Epsi is only function of Z. And if you have such combinations, it breaks the, it is just a function of Z. So it has to be, it has to be able to transform in a meaningful way under transformation of Z to say W of Z. So, so if you have in this form, In
in this form, if you make such a transformation, each of these will transform independently. But if you mix them up, then you cannot. No, this has to have this transformation for its Z. Um, so if you if you if you say I want a green function that's real, I have to have multiplied two things together. So this is now, better. Yes. Can you repeat how we found the value of h, the minus 1 half? Yeah, from the action. The action. So I, I assume that epsilon lambda z is equal to lambda h epsi z. So I put it in here, it gives me lambda 2h. From here, lambda minus 1. And here, lambda 2 d2x. Sum them all up is lambda 2h minus 1 times that. And thus h is 1 half. So plus 1 is minus 1. But my definition of conformal weights had lambda to minus h. So I should be careful really say lambda minus h minus 2h minus 2h plus 1 half. So this is true now. Can you conclude what, sorry? I don't get the question. I look at this equation psi lambda z equals lambda two minus psi of z. Lambda min minus h to psi of z, yes. Equation. Yes, okay. From the second equation, can I conclude that the z dependence of psi is just z to the power minus h? No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> No, you you can you cannot interpret that because <coughs> because these I am when I think of these things these are not a smooth functions they are densities or if you like distributions over some space so it it doesn't it's uh, like the discussion we had about the. Uh, if the, the, the Weierstrass function. It has to be something mathematically really horrible. It is not a smooth function. That, But you, what you can conclude is that it's expectation. So if you have this guy, this expectation can exactly equals lambda to minus h epsi of z. Because these things are a smooth functions. Now, of course, two options are possible. Either that this is z to minus h, and the other is that it is 0. And of course, it is 0 because you have a single field, two vacuums on either side. But for if in here, it is much easier to interpret
So these guys now are a smooth functions. And if I multiply them by lambda, then it is true that this is equal to lambda minus 2h epsi epsi. And since these entities are a smooth functions, then it follows that it has to be of this form. The psi itself is an operator. It's a very nasty operator. It's a density itself. So of course, you know that better than me. <laughs> In the, it, it, is, it should be valid in the sense of distribution. Yes, true. Okay, let's stop here. <laughs>